And thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the Harvard Law School Library, I'd like to welcome <coughs> you to today's book talk in celebration of the recent release by the Oxford University Press of, and this is the hard part because I'm not sure if I should adopt a tone of humor, a tone of incredulity, or a tone of despair. Constitutional Democracy in Crisis, okay. Edited by Mark Graber, Sanford Levinson, and Mark Tushnet. Join, uh, joining us for today's book talk are, to my, right to my left, Mark Tushnet, who is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law at Harvard <coughs> Law School, um, Sanford Levinson, who is the W. St. John Garwood and W. St. John Garwood Jr. Centennial Chair in Law at the University of Texas Law School and Visiting Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Also joining us are uh, Vicki Jackson, who is the Thurgood Marshall Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School. And today, our local faculty are joined by um, Catherine Young, who is the Associate Professor of Boston College Law School, and hopefully, um, Professor Stephen Levisky, who is a Harvard University Professor of Government, who may be looking for our room, okay, who hasn't arrived yet. So before we get started, I have just a few announcements. Um, if you haven't already noticed, the Law School Coop is here right outside the door selling copies of Constitutional Democracy in Crisis. And um, Professors Tushnet and Levinson will be ha here after the talk for signing books. I would also like to thank the Dean's Office today for uh, sponsoring today's lunch. And finally, I just would like to remind you that today's talk is being recorded, and it will be available on the Law School's YouTube channel uh, approximately two weeks after today's talk. Thank you, and I will now turn the microphone over to our speakers. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm going to sit here just so that none of us have to go through the logistics of coming up to the, uh, uh, the podium unless uh, people want to. Um, so this book is uh, one of a number uh, uh, dealing with uh, seeming crises in constitutional democracies around the world. Uh, so Professor Sunstein uh, recently co-edited a book called uh, Can It Happen Here, uh, which uh, seeks to draw lessons, if any, from worldwide experience to compare it to the U.S. experience. Um, Professor Levitsky has co-authored a very important book uh, on uh, d democracies in decline. Uh, Tom Ginsburg and Aziz Huck have a book coming out on a similar topic. Um, obviously, there's something in the air. Uh, what I want to do is actually raise some questions about the enterprise, and the way of doing this is to note that uh, we decided to uh, give the book the title Constitutional Democracies in Crisis, question uh, mark, because we thought that uh, this concern in the air uh, might be valid, but also might be um, I don't know what the right word is, overstated or projecting some permanence into a phenomenon that might be only uh, temporary. That is, the, the idea in the air is that uh, we're experiencing a widespread crisis for, co widespread crisis for co constitutional democracy. So I want to raise and use my time to raise a few questions about this, uh, obviously very uh, uh, sketchy, and happy if we have time to talk about it uh, afterwards. First, uh, the asserted crisis is fairly recent, uh, or put another way, uh, the nations that are said to be experience a crisis of constitutional democracy have been in that situation for no more than a decade, and in many places for a shorter period at the moment, if we want to include the United States in that, less than two years, uh, 10 or even 15 years is not that long in any nation's political experience, although for those living through bad times, things are gonna be quite bad uh, for a while. Uh, we don't really know, though, whether we're observing something permanent about constitutional democracy in these nations or something like, the normal ebb and flow of politics where, I can't figure out which way to do this, so I've, this is the version, the ebb has perhaps taken the tide a bit farther out than we're used to. Uh, 
But for all we know now, in many pl places, the th flow may bring things back in a few more years, and indeed the flow might be even more vigorous than the ebb or whatever. You can work out the metaphor if you want. Um, so for me, the experience of Ecuador is instructive. Articles written five or six years ago uh, routinely listed Ecuador, along with Venezuela and Bolivia, as experienced democratic retrogression, or whatever the author's favorite term was. Uh, Rafael Correa looked like populist leaders elsewhere, both with respect to the economic programs he promoted and the constitutional changes he sought. But it turned out Correa may have been a blip. The Ecuadorian constitution was indeed amended substantially, but Correa was unable to extend his own term of office. The story here is quite complicated in detail, but the bottom line is that Correa had to leave office. His de he designated his lieutenant, uh, uh, Lenin Moreno, uh, as his successor, and Moreno turned on Correa and undid the constitutional changes. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in Ecuador over the next few years, but for the moment, the best characterization seems to me to be something like Correa ebb, Moreno flow, not much to notice here. Um, and the fact that, and this is the second point, the fact that uh, accounts of democratic decline almost always focus on individual leaders, Correa, uh, Hugo Chavez, Morales in South America, Trump in the United States, Orban, Kaczynski, Erdogan in Eurasia, is suggestive. Uh, most, if not all of them, are fairly described as charismatic, at least in their national context. That is, you know, doesn't seem to me that Erdogan is terribly uh, charismatic, but Turks apparently think that he is, um, or, or Narendra Modi in, in India. Uh, whether their charisma can be institutionalized after they leave seems to me an open question. Um, uh, the current turmoil in Venezuela uh, suggests uh, uh, the difficulties. Maduro's inability to institutionalize Chavez's charisma means that it's no longer helpful to describe Venezuela as a constitutional democracy in crisis. To me, failed state seems more accurate. Again, it may take quite a while for the current leaders to pass from the scene, and meanwhile, life in their nations may be quite unpleasant for their opponents, uh, but those interested in the course of constitutional development uh, probably ought to take a longer uh, uh, perspective and throw a lot of maybes and perhaps not yet buts into their arguments. Third point is uh, uh, the story of constitutional democracies in decline probably has to be supplemented by uh, constitutional democracies resurgent. Um, so here, I, I don't, haven't thought this through in much detail, but here I think the, the primary recent example is uh, Malaysia, where an authoritarian government rigged an election and managed to lose it. This is really extraordinary. Uh, you, you look at what they tried to do. I mean, they really rigged it. Um, and then lost massively. So that's, you know, an encouraging story. Uh, and, in, and incidentally, the new prime minister uh, um, is somebody who, when he was last in office, was regarded as a potential authoritarian. So who knows? Um, finally, uh, this one's uh, likely to be even more controversial. Decline, of course, is in this context uh, a, a pejorative term. Uh, maybe what we're observing is a proliferation of variants of constitutional democracy. Um, uh, examples of nations that have declined from a reasonably robust constitutional democracy to the c contemporary equivalent of Stalinist Russia are rare. Um, uh, the closest probably is uh, Hungary, and even there, there seems to be a reasonably vigorous civil society of opposition. So maybe what we're seeing is a redefinition of many com components of constitutional democracy. Freedom of expression, for example, or some rough equality of competition uh, in, in elections. Um, quite robust definitions have been replaced by substantially weakened, weaker ones, and along many, though not all, of the dimensions that make up uh, constitutional democracy. Still, riding one of my hobby horses, maybe we ought to try to see Morales' Bolivia as an inst interesting attempt uh, 
to institutionalize a different kind idea of what we mean by constitutional democracy. Uh, and frankly, if Bar Morales is Bolivia, why not Trump's United States? And, and to be even more provocative, why not Kaczynski's Poland or Hungary's uh, or Orman's Hungary? So just to wrap this up, um, there clearly is something happening here. And we don't know what it is, to quote you know, a Nobel Prize winning <laughs> author. Uh, uh, but uh, reflecting on what it is uh, uh, seems to me uh, uh, both useful, but also necessarily, I don't know, more qualified than the uh, notion of a widespread crisis uh, suggests. Thank you. Um, I've had the pleasure of participating in these events several times before, usually focusing on what I don't like about the United States Constitution, why we need a new Constitutional Convention, and indeed I wrote a review of the Levitsky Ziblatt book criticizing it. It's, it's quite a good book, but criticizing it for not taking into account the structural costs imposed by the 1787 Constitution. Uh, but I'm really not going to dwell on that today because this book really is a book about countries all over the world. Um, so Marx's evocation of Malaysia, Bolivia, Ecuador, Poland, Hungary is altogether faithful to this book. And, but it also causes one, if one is an editor of this, to think in more quite literally global terms. So the essay, my essay in this book, I don't think even mentions the deficiencies of the United States Constitution or indeed the more general problems posed by particular constitutional structures, whether in France, Germany, or fill in the blank ad infinitum for the 191 or so countries in the United Nations at the current time. Rather, I focus on a single big idea that I identify, perhaps because I'm American, there are other identifying sources, of popular sovereignty and self-determination. Uh, if one wishes, one could identify this with Vladimir Lenin, who wrote a very interesting book on self-determination. There obviously is a European tradition uh, of Herder, Mazzini, uh, Kosuth, etc. I focus on, on Woodrow Wilson, not only because he's an American and won the Nobel Prize Prize, but because I think that he is in some ways the leading figure behind uh, the most important political idea of the 20th and 21st century, that is popular sovereignty and self-determination. One could push that back and say it's the most important idea of the last three or four centuries um, uh, since Thomas Hobbes and others slew the idea of divine right of kings and had to find a different basis of legitimacy and that basis is some mysterious entity called the people, as in we the people, who ostensibly ordain constitutions and provide the basis of an order. I have come to the conclusion that not only is it the most important single political idea, but it may be the most pernicious single political idea, at least in some of its consequences. Now, it's very hard for any American I think to say the idea of we the people, government by the people, governments getting their legitimacy from consent of the governed is a pernicious idea. The problem as the students enrolled in my reading course this term on popular sovereignty know, especially with regard to this afternoon's class, the devil is in defining who we the people are. Um, and quite frankly, there is no good answer to defining who we the people are, whether it's we the people of the United States, of uh, Germany, of any of the countries, perhaps other than Iceland. Uh, Iceland might claim to be a genuine nation state. Quite frankly, I don't know of any other country larger than Iceland, especially if it's not an island, that can claim to be a nation state. All states are multinational. Um, that is true of this country, it's true of Israel, it's true of China. Walk through the world map and you see pluralistic, 
multinational states in collision with the idea that they're supposed to be, in some sense, nation states. And not surprisingly, those national entities that had been used to running things, uh, whether you define them in terms of race, white supremacy in the United States, which certainly cannot be ignored as a factor explaining the current unhappiness in this country. It can be religious, it can be ethnic, um, but whatever it is, traditional ruling elites defined by reference to ascriptive identities, not the universalistic sort of, uh, you know, we're all just the, you know, the, uh, the children of God and brothers and sisters to one another, uh, a noble notion that has never gotten full purchase uh, around the world. But the notion of self-determination, national determination, is, I believe, one of the things that is behind the attack, not so much on constitutional democracy, as Marx suggests, there are a lot of different notions of what a constitutional democracy might look like, but liberal democracy, which is defined, I think, more or less in um, pluralistic, multinational, even universalistic terms, and that's in collision with an idea that no, we, the, the people of fill in the blank, are entitled to control the other reading course I'm giving this semester is on public monuments, are entitled to control whose statues are in front of capitals, are entitled to control what the dominant language will be, are entitled to control ultimately how we present ourselves to the world. And so I think, you know, whatever my unhappiness with the United States Constitution, one can't deny the profound, deep, I personally think on balance certainly beneficial consequences of the Immigration Reform Act in I think it was 1965 that is at the same time that it all coincidentally as the most important piece of domestic legislation in my lifetime which is the Voting Rights Act of 1965 but also the Simpson-Mazzoli um, uh, legislation passed under the Reagan administration that fundamentally changed the, the nature of the United States. And then you look around, and it's, it ought not be surprising that immigration is one of the key issues all around the world, because immigration does, in fact, change the nature of any so-called nation state and ultimately, quite frankly, destroys the notion, any comfortable notion at least, of what we mean by a nation state. Oh, okay. So I am gonna stand because of my back. Um, uh, so it's, it's a wonderful book. I hope that you will all get a chance to at least uh, browse through it. Um, my talk is going to focus not on one big idea, but on what I see as threats to constitutional democracy um, coming from, on, uh, targeted at least three essential institutions. I'm not saying these are the only ones, but they are important. And those institutions are law, representation, and knowledge. And I'll explain, I'll try to explain a little bit what I mean by these. Uh, I'm going to use examples uh, drawn mostly from the United States in this talk, but I want to say that the chapters in the book provide many examples of attacks on these institutions in a number of the countries under study. In the world in which we live, ideas about law, ideas about the construction of a state, ideas about immigration, ideas about inclusion or non-inclusion, travel. It is not only good ideas that migrate from one country in the world to another. Bad ideas can migrate too. Um, and so um, with that in mind, let me just elaborate on these three areas of threats. I don't think you can have a decent constitutional democracy without law to provide a framework for governance, to protect competitive electoral processes, 
to protect minority rights and to prevent abuses of power. Thus, when high political figures overtly attack judges, call them so-called judges, this is not like firing 2,700 judges in Turkey, but it is a bit worrisome. It is a bit worrisome when the president issues a pardon of someone convicted of a criminal contempt of a federal court. I want to focus on that. The Supreme Court of the United States has said that the power to punish contempts is inherent in all courts, is essential to the preservation of order in judicial proceedings, and to the due administration of justice. So not like firing 2,700 judges in Turkey, but maybe concerning. Attacks from high places on all of the institutions of justice in the federal government, the Justice Department, the FBI, federal prosecutors. Um, and I could go on uh, and talk about some of the arguable encouragements to violence that we have seen. Violence is, in my account, sort of the opposite of law. How do you resolve disputes? There's law, there's violence. I mean, there are other ways. But all right, so that's just a sketch of the ways in which I see law being under assault. Let me come now to representation and its institutions. I'm in the middle of reading a book. Um, it's very compelling reading uh, by Carol Anderson called One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Democracy. And I thought I was following this area of development fairly closely. But I was shocked. I, I'm so old, you'd think I'd lose the capacity to be shocked. But I was shocked at, at some of what is recounted in the book. For example, uh, after uh, some states enacted very rigorous voter ID requirements, essentially effectively requiring that the voter have a driver's license to be able to be a registered voter, closing driver license bureaus in you can guess what kinds of counties. I was a little bit shocked because a foundation for the, what I'm going to call the, um, the spirit of a decent democracy is to recognize that every person in it who's an adult should have an equal right to vote. You want your side to win, but not at all costs. You don't want to permanently suppress either side uh, uh, of, of um, these kinds of um, disagreements. Uh, uh, Professor Asakharov has a very good chapter in this book on populism and democracy in which he argues that democracy depends on what he calls temporal aspects of repeat play. My word for that is reciprocity, an awareness that you may be up now, but you may be down later, and so you want to adhere to some basic rules of fair dealing. Uh, we are seeing a decline in that spirit of reciprocity, in voter suppression efforts, in the, what John, Senator McCain complained of as the lack of regular order in the Congress, which is our principal representative institution at the national level. Uh, when you see the encouragement of criminal prosecution of your opponent, this is a quite scary phenomena, I think, because it leads to the disappearance of the idea of loyal opposition and to the idea of enmity, from which, if you go down the road far enough, you have one has seen civil wars arise uh, in the past. Um, all of these are inconsistent with what Jennifer Hochschild in another chapter in this book called um, threats to civic nationalism in the United States, the idea, and Professor Levinson referred to this, that all Americans are entitled to respect and toleration, no matter their race, religion, or ethnic heritage. I have many more examples there, but I'm going to turn to my third, uh, oh, one more point. Millennials, it turns out, around the world and in the United States, are becoming less convinced that democratic governance is a good idea. This is also very concerning. In the United States in 1995, only 16% of people ages 16 to 24 thought democracy was a, was a bad way to run the country. By 2011, that number had risen to 
and that's a significant rise. And there have been similar rises on similar questions in a number of countries around the world concerning about representative institutions in a democracy. Last, knowledge and the institutions that produce and test it. And here I want to briefly mention three institutions, all of which have come under attack. First, universities. What do I mean? Sharp partisan divide emerged after 2015 in the United States on whether universities and colleges are good for United States. The part, most Dems think they're very good and most Republicans think they're not. That's concerning. That's concerning. Um, uh, foreign enrollment, I just read this morning. Graduate er enrollments, first time enrollments, are down 4% in the last year. In one year drop from the Council of Graduate Education because the United States is being perceived as unwelcoming to students and, and faculty from other countries and is slow down um, the visa uh, processing. Now, if I look at Turkey, and I don't mean to pick on Turkey, it's Ozan Baral had a very good chapter with numbers in it, and I like numbers. 1,600 university deans fired by the government. That's not where we are, and I don't mean to suggest it, but it is concerning. Um, uh, the tax, very small tax granted that was imposed on endowments, some of you may think this is a good idea, but I kind of think it's a good idea to have some economic power centers that are not in the government and not in the for-profit sector. So it worries me. Uh, and I want to say I don't think it's an accident that some of the people who in recent decades have been most willing to testify against nominees have come from academia with its traditions of protecting dissent and free speech. Okay, the second one of these institutions, do I still have time, Mark, or am I? Okay, the press. We have heard repeated attacks on the press. In Professor Hochschild's chapter, she says of President Trump's post-inaugural tweets, 89 out of 167 were attacks on the press. Um, why is, and again, on whether the press the, is a good or a bad thing for the country, there's an intense partisan divide. The Democrats are kind of 50-50, they're not so sure. But the Republicans, 85%, think the press is bad. But you know, without a press, how do we find out about wrongdoing? I'm not arguing that what the press does is always wonderful, but how do we find out? Um, now, there are real challenges um, to the role of the press uh, that have developed today because of the development of social media outlets that provide virtually no filtering. And those are challenges to the knowledge-creating, knowledge-checking role of a free press that I'm hoping the folks in this room will help think through. But uh, it's a concern. And finally, the third kind of institutional part of the knowledge base that I've been thinking about is what we might think about as information generating parts of the government. We might think about whether we have sort of epistemic integrity organs or objectivity organs. What am I talking about here? Um, well, first, let me draw a contrast between the UK Cabinet Manual, which is about the principles that all public officials should live by. I'm going to read it to you. It's very short. Selflessness, integrity, objectivity. Objectivity. I'll stop reading there. I've looked at comparable statements in the US. I haven't found objectivity. So that may be a broader uh, cultural question. But there have been numerous reports, and I don't really know how serious this is, of scientists, for example, who work for the CDC, being told there are words they cannot use. Those words include evidence-based, fetus, transgender, science-based. About EPA scientists who had agreed to speak at conferences being told, you can't speak about a proposal coming out again of EPA of saying EPA can't consider any scientific papers unless all the data on which they're based is made public, which when you first hear it, I think sounds like a pretty good idea, except, in, for example, in the field of public health, there are studies done on promises of confidentiality if people report medical information. 
It's a problem. So how worried am I? I am not without hope. Uh, we still have a very vibrant um, sector of dissent and disagreement, but I am um, pretty concerned. And I thought Professor Hochschild's warnings to beware both of false nostalgia, to imagine that there was some golden age in the past, but also a false sense of security and hope that we can continue um, having events like this and books like this to uh, try and uh, uh, keep things working better. Okay, so I'm gonna start my remarks um, in congratulating the editors uh, for assembling such a comprehensive range of topics and countries and perspectives. It's a real tour de force, I think, of collaborative and timely scholarship. Uh, all of us accept, I think, that a language of crisis can be a very dangerous trope in constitutional observations. Uh, clearly, they can connect to notions of exceptional or emergency measures that are suddenly justified. But I think here there is an urgent note of caution that is duly deployed across the many countries that are observed in this book, uh, which connect the dots between various declines in constitutional democracies and present the challenge of how to confront the fact that this model of constitutional organization, which we are so familiar with, uh, may have peaked. So it certainly roused this reader. I really encourage you all to <coughs> read this book. Um, I thought I'd speak to two issues in particular today, uh, but I think each chapter deserves its own kind of book panel. There is just uh, so much discussed. I'm gonna focus on what I would describe as an egalitarian deficit that we're observing in constitutional democracies, as well as uh, some comments about the tools with which we study the phenomenon of constitutional crisis. So let me turn first to this notion of economic egalitarian deficits in our constitutions. Now, as economic data makes very clear, we are living in an era of escalating, even galloping economic inequality. This is a phenomenon that tracks income and, of course, wealth inequality within and between most countries. And it's severely impacting the stable, industrialized democracies. And these lines were made very clear after the 2008 financial crisis. And in many chapters of this book, we see economic inequality as a key driver of constitutional crisis, at least of political instability and on some occasions constitutional crisis. Uh, it's a driver when the shrinking and sinking middle and working classes become fed up with their constitutional institutions and turn to populism and the idea of burning the house down. And also wherever wealthier classes get to influence and control elites and the policy and legislation choices they make to further entrench a political economy that favors them. There are, of course, other drivers to constitutional decline or constitutional crisis. The book covers immigration, globalization, religion, corruption, and climate change. All of these can be seen to feed into economic arguments, but also they stand alone. I'm just gonna foreground the economic uh, in my remarks. Um, these underlie the much more easily observed trends of the rise in executive power, the disarray and dysfunction of legislative power, the incoherence of political parties, and the rise and potential capture of courts. Okay, so in t taking this particular piece on the egalitarian deficit, we find in this book various constitutions to be at fault. So we find the US model, which provides no express pretext under which constitutions should address economic inequality, um, despite many other egalitarian commitments. Um, the idea is that these kinds of arguments occur in the world of politics and mainly economics, not of constitutional domains, and that we know that there are various policy options that are out there that would favor a more egalitarian economic order, such as those that favor progressive taxation, um, labor and workplace protections, um, anti-competitive policies and financial regulation, and of course, public goods provisioning in areas such as healthcare and education and so forth. 
Now, the US model contains constitutional, uh, civil and political liberties. These do much in favour of status equality between persons. Um, somewhat, they do move towards a less uh, economically disadvantaged picture, but they don't come out explicitly in defence or permitting or even requiring any forms of greater economic uh, redistribution. Uh, the notions that property and contract are protected and reliable are, are kind of the high point of constitutional political economy. Now there is a second model covered in this book which is the more contemporary, more expansive, more positive constitutions which have been the main architecture and the main trend um, since at least the Second World War. So the US in this respect and its constitution is an outlier and various other constitutions now around the world contain various uh, ideas about addressing economic inequality through express economic and social rights to education, to healthcare as uh, main rights, but also to housing and so forth, uh, social security. Um, and also uh, some of which contain other explicit policy proposals ratified within the constitutional text, such as for progressive taxation. Now, in this book, these constitutions and the various economic and social rights that are protected are faltered for three main reasons. First, they're seen as tokenistic. Uh, so in many of the uh, constitutions, the economic and social rights provisions have capitulated to the real engine or structure of power that is uh, set up under the constitution that un ultimately undermines them. And I would recommend Roberto Gargarella's work on Latin American constitutions for this phenomenon. There is also the problem of very minimalistic economic and social rights. And these rest on an idea of uh, poverty alleviation um, that actually allow inequalities to continue and may in fact rely on inequalities to sustain themselves. Um, and this is very well expressed in this book by uh, Ganesh Siddharaman's work. And there are similar critiques being made about the human rights movement and economic and social rights ideas there. And the third problem with this constitutional model is that it's court dependent, that if it does work and becomes more than minimalistic or more than tokenistic, it relies on friendly courts to take over the enforcement of economic and social rights. Um, and this is a very fragile reliance given how quickly they can be captured um, by the executive. And this comes out in work on Hungary and South Africa in this book um, and chapters by Sujit Chowdhury, Wojciech Sadurski and Mark Graeber. So these are the three big problems of economic and social rights, of constitutions having anything to say about rising economic inequality. Um, in short, the constitutions either fail because they don't imagine any redistributive compulsion, or if they require it, they're just destined to fail, fail for the reasons I've mentioned. And then we get this two-part problem of either, ha either having oligarchs in control of a highly um, unequal society or demagogues um, on behalf of the poor. Um, now, I want to say while there are very clear cases of each of these uh, phenomena at work, the tokenistic, the minimalistic, and the court-dependent economic and social rights, there are cases in which such rights operate in more transformative ways when they're understood as structural rather than individualistic, when they are understood to be more than ameliorative, and that, that, we're un that when they're understood more complexly in relation to courts. <laughs> and this, of course, relies on a departure of certain understandings of rights um, that is fed into by comparative experience. So rights as political, rights as galvanizing social movements, um, and as outsourcing and perhaps catalyzing actors to hold governments to account, to comply with particular court orders, um, and generally be more responsive in their institutional capacities. And so there's an idea that rights, given what we know of them, may hold out some hope um, in the very hollowed out institutions of democracy that we're seeing. Now, this uh, is a very hard and challenging story to present um, because, of course, of the reasons of failure that I mentioned. Um, but I want to say that the other methods of tackling inequality and the harm that we know it does to constitutional democracy are much harder. Um, and historians have told us that tackling large-scale inequality has only happened in the past through violence or catastrophe. 
Um, so I kind of see this um, as an appropriate warning about uh, the need to rethink our institutional arrangements somewhat and prevent further erosions and crisis. And we can talk, talk about the story of variance as well. But this leads me to my second comments, which are about how we should be thinking uh, about the present moment and the tools which we're using um, to think with. And many of the chapters in this book really call for new categories and new tools of analysis to move political science forward, to move sociology forward. Um, and the, there are really excellent chapters dealing with very fine-grained commentaries uh, focusing on choices and choosers in uh, constitutional decline, moments of choices and choosers taking place at critical junctures, um, rather than ideas of economic and institutional correlates which are much harder to steer. And I think it's really excellent to observe this fine-grained uh, picture uh, occurring. It's obviously been a very long understood idea in constitutional theory, um, and it's made all the more critical by comparative analysis that the domain of constitutional law extends beyond text to context, and that we have to confront notions of what the underlying norms are, the constitutional culture, the constitutional conventions are that allow us to uh, adhere to or depart from previously understood arrangements. Um, but constitutional culture still remains a somewhat fuzzy term, and this book really invites us to develop a, a, our sociological understanding of constitutional crisis, of how things happened, happen and how we perceive them as implicating the Constitution. So two points to end with um, in theorizing the boundaries of constitutional law. One is very concrete, uh, and it really follows, I think, Vicky's remarks. The second is much more broad. The first is that I think we do need to understand a little better about how our participants, the main participants in driving constitutional culture and the democratic constituents relate to each other. And so I would uh, you know, suggest an extra chapter in this book on the operation of the press, um, the participants in, uh, in the field of uh, journalism and the press, as well as the distance between what the press produces and what is circulated on social media and what influences uh, people and their ways of thinking about their democracy there. So that would be one concrete suggestion. But another much broader one is to really celebrate the scope of an undertaking um, in a work such as this and to think um, more sociologically about the domain of constitutional studies. Thank you. Uh, so shall I? If you, if, you, if you have other remarks, otherwise we no. can go to Yes, yeah, so no, yeah. just go to questions. Uh, Please raise your hand. So. Hi, thank you for a great talk. Um, I had a question for Professor Young. Um, I really enjoyed the talk. I, I really enjoyed the analysis of the problems with socioeconomic rights, but I'm wondering if the alternatives that you sketched out would really be sufficient to make them effective tools of socioeconomic change. And um, I'm thinking here of the work of Mila Versteg, who says that um, really these rights, if you're choosing between rights of association, rights that are going to empower social actors, so rights that make unions possible, for instance, versus individual rights, that you should really choose the latter. That, I mean, I know you said that rights might galvanize social movements, but I would think that what's much more important is that you have those social movements there <coughs> in the first place. And so that the places where constitutions might help with socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic redistribution is not mandating it, even in more complex ways that you suggest, or even in ways that are more genuine than are happening now, but that constitutions should really empower social actors themselves to have the heft and weight to make sure that these changes happen in the first place. Okay, uh, great question. So uh, there is a kind of chicken and egg uh, idea but behind economic and social rights because they are reliant, if they're most effective, on various civil and political protections, freedom of association, you know, social and economic rights are gonna be effective if people can associate together. So I wouldn't necessarily put them as an either or choice, um, but I do think economic and social rights add something more than simply freedom of association. So what happens is private catastrophes, you know, we know the understanding of crisis and catastrophe as a driver of social change, 
but with rights, private catastrophes become articulated as something wrong with the political system. Uh, and they obviously can misfire and they can be uh, argued about. But it is this, this trans transformation of a private catastrophe, a private perception of misfortune into a right that makes a, a, an individual or group demand something from the state. Um, that, I think, differentiates these rights, and when they are successful, clearly an individual is not articulating a private catastrophe alone. Um, it will be when uh, individuals experiencing the same catastrophe um, leverage together um, their social movement power. Hi. <clears throat> Sorry. Hi. Um, thank you for the great talk. I'm looking forward to looking at the book. Um, I do have a question, maybe prof for Professor Tushnit, about um, the way how it seems to be th the the idea of this constitutional democracy in crisis may seem like a global idea, and I do have some skepticism about when the crisis reach every part of the world. <laughs> because if we talk about populism, for example, in Latin America, since you use the example of Bolivia and Ecuador, and yeah, I mean, there's a different wave of populism in the past decade, but the region itself has been, has a very complicated history of authoritarianism and populism. So where are the boundaries drawn to think about um, this as a very specific moment of crisis? considering the regional you know, problems that each country faces, and in this case, each region faces, to talk about this kind of global approach to a constitutional democratic crisis. Thanks. Yeah, so I think that um, the, the caution that you suggest is, is uh, clearly uh, well placed. That is, um, it, we have to be careful about uh, uh, isolating the current events from uh, histories of particular nations and, as you suggest, regions. Um, at the same time, there, there may be some quasi-new phenomena uh, associated with, uh, just to use the jargon, globalization and uh, um, flows of people and capital uh, that have uh, reduced, this is tied to Sandy's observation, that have reduced the ability of national uh, uh, populations uh, to determine policy for their nations. Uh, and uh, I say quasi uh, new because um, there's now there's a lot of studies showing that there was a, an era of globalization before World War I that was roughly equivalent in terms of capital flows and, and population flows to what we're experiencing now. Um, uh, so there may be something new uh, in, in connection with uh, self-governing ability that may be generating anxieties in a more widespread way that singles out these moments, or the current moment in various places from similar moments in, other, in, in the same places in the past. Uh, it's, I think you know, the caution by the question mark, I guess, is uh, uh, more widespread than I suggested in my initial comments. Uh, hello, my name is Dia. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, you speak of uh, the Latin American uh, examples of populism and uh, East European ones, um, but um, Latin America is experiencing the you know, hangover from left-wing uh, populism while um, it's the right-wing populism that is a concern in Europe and in this country at the moment. Um, now, um, and different things had brought about uh, those uh, things. You know, it was true democratization in Latin America in the last 30 years in Latin America. It was the concern with immigration in, in Europe. Um, so the causes of those uh, uh, populist regimes were different um, too. Uh, now, my question is, 
um, do we accept, I mean, what, what is called as populism today, uh, when, uh, say, the opinion of the experts and the elite uh, are being disregarded and are considered to be uh, no longer authoritative, and people, uh, people go and vote for populists. Um, is it not democracy? I mean, is it, what's the difference between, say, populism and true democracy, ultimately? And should uh, we accept that uh, populist as a phenomena <coughs> and as a deficiency, like as an inherent deficiency of a, of a democracy, or should, do you think, as constitutional scholars, um, constitutions provide for safeguards against populism? Uh, say, like Electoral College that was envisaged in that way, which ironically actually brought about a populist in this country. Thank you. Um, so just two quick observations. One is that my chapter in the book is about the distinction between left-wing and right-wing populism, and I think that is a serious distinction. Uh, uh, second, which I have to do some more uh, work on. Uh, the second is, again, about... Uh, populism and democracy. Um, uh, what I argue in my chapter, roughly speaking, is that um, sort of from the post-World War II period or maybe from the post-1989 period, uh, elites offered a deal to the public generally, which was, uh, we'll, we'll run the economy and we'll get a lot out of it. Uh, but you'll get, so, you know, we'll distribute some of the benefits uh, to you. Uh, and, uh, and that sort of worked until the elites reneged on the deal. Uh, um, and now people are annoyed. You know, elites have taken over the money and have not uh, con been concerned about uh, reducing inequality or, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats. It's just, um, and under those circumstances, populist resentment seems in your terms, democratic. Now, that's obviously a very condensed version of the argument, but there's, there is something to the uh, idea that uh, you know, there was consent to a certain arrangement, uh, which arrangement was violated by one side, uh, and now people aren't consenting to it anymore. If I can... Jump in for a moment, and it's another reason for regretting that Professor Lutsky couldn't make it. Um, I think the discussion of democracy outside of you know, certain esoteric political theorists is dismal. So that you know, the title of their book is How Democracies Die. And again, I want to repeat, it's, it's a quite good book worth reading, but there is never any systematic definition of what's meant by democracy. There's no recognition that the notion of democracy is what political theorists call an essentially contested concept. And so Yasha Munk has, from the Kennedy School has also written a book uh, adverting to, I think, what Vicky mentioned, the decline of faith or belief in democracy, particularly by younger people. Well, you know, my first book and what's come out, what's turned out to be by now a trilogy of books attacking the U.S. Constitution is our undemocratic constitution. So, you know, I don't think it expresses a loss of belief in democracy to say that you don't have any particular faith in the very peculiar American form of so-called democracy, and this links with Professor Young's comment, I've become much more Madisonian in terms of treating a lot of the Constitution as parchment barriers, as not really being all that significant at the end of the day. That's why I've turned my interest much more to structures. So let's assume that we had kind of your favorite set of economic and social rights that almost by definition would require redistribution of income to urban states. Well, you look at the map of the Senate, or you look, first of all, at population maps. Um, um, a majority of the population in the United States now live in nine of the states. You can do the math. They get 18 senators. Less than a majority of the population live in the remaining uh, 
41 states. They get 82 senators. Um, there used to be a discussion that really didn't matter that the small states were indefensibly represented in terms of allocation of voting power in the Senate. That's just false in a whole variety of areas. They're not going to vote to redistribute funds to New York, California, even Texas, um, and the like. We have this ridiculous subsidization of farmers in Iowa because of the consequences of Trump's tariff policies. Nobody talks about subsidization of other losers from American policy. And so I really do think, and the Supreme Court, God knows, is of no help whatsoever in coming up with any coherent notion of what's meant by democracy, because it's assumed we've just got one and it's terrific. So it does seem to me that we need a much, much more systematic discussion <coughs> of variations of democracy, and then why one would prefer option A to option B to option C. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, if there is one. No. Okay, well, thank you. Uh